kind of the uh, classic story told of uh, Samuel, Samuel Morris. And the reason I say classic, that means I'm repeating a story I've said before. See, anytime a pastor or a teacher says, you know, there's a classic story, that means I'm saying this again. So, you know, I, and I realize that I've probably told you before. But uh, Samuel Morris is a missionary in Africa for about 25 years. Uh, when he and his wife actually began to come back to the United States, they happened to be on the same boat as Teddy Roosevelt, who was a president at the time and had been in Africa uh, hunting for three weeks. So as they're coming into New York Harbor, because of the president being on board, there was bands playing, literally children's choir singing, you know, ticker tape parade, uh, you know, the whole thing uh, is going on. The press is there and all the news crews and, uh, and so forth. And uh, Samuel Morris uh, began to uh, think to, to himself that, uh, you know, here I am, I've been serving you, Lord, for 25 years, you know, and no, nobody even seems to care or even know that I'm here. In fact, he, this was the little prayer he said, at least in his own mind, he said, Lord, the president has been in Africa for three weeks killing animals and the whole world turns out to welcome them home. I've given 25 years of my life in Africa serving you. And no one has greeted me or even knows that I'm here. And then he said as he began to walk off the gangplate uh, in a small, quiet voice, he heard the word, Samuel, you're not home yet. <laughs> so, uh, this isn't the greeting. This isn't the place where pilgrims were just passing through. But uh, heaven is coming, a real place that Jesus promised he's preparing for us there in John chapter 14. And uh, where he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take uh, you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Uh, and, uh, and he talks about being a, a place, uh, NIV New American Standard, some of the other translations use the, the room, a place or a room he's preparing. But uh, after we read about what he's preparing, uh, uh, we'll probably more agree with the King James, New King James, which says mansions. He's preparing a, a mansion. So... I don't know what he's preparing for you, but he's preparing a mansion for me <laughs> based on the description that we get here uh, in, in chapter 21. Uh, again, the, the city which has foundations, who builder and maker is God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Verse 9, we see the city is presented to John by a mighty angel. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me saying, come and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So uh, we first note the city is presented by an angel and, and kind of interesting, you know, could have been a lot. Of, there's a few different angels in heaven that could have done this, but it's, it's one of the angels with the seven bowls of wrath of the seven last plagues is the one that's showing him this glorious sight where we're going to be for, for all eternity. Uh, and at least I, I think it speaks of the character of God, that he is holy and he is righteous, and therefore he is good. And because he is good, he will punish sin, the wrath. At the same time, uh, he is good uh, and he is loving and he is gracious and he is compassionate and he is forgiving. Therefore, the new, the new Jerusalem is, is presented. So you, know, you have really both even in the presentation of the city with this particular angel. Uh, and then the, the city is presented as a bride, the wife of the lamb, kind of interesting. We are uh, referred to as the bride of Christ in the New Testament. Uh, Israel is referred to as the wife of Jehovah. Uh, you get both of these ideas, and that's, and that's referred to as the city, the place that we're actually going to uh, live for, uh, for all eternity. So... Uh, Again, the, it's very interesting the tie-in with the reference to us and who we are and our relationship with Christ becomes the name of the place where we will live with him for, uh, for all eternity. And of course, then John goes into this spectacular description, but always, again, the reference to the lamb. Uh, 28 times uh, in the book, the word lamb appears giving special meaning, of course, to the fact that it's Jesus who died for our sins. He's the one that has provided the way. It's the reason that we can enter uh, the holy city. Uh, the third thing is the city is presented as descending out of heaven. We saw that last week earlier in chapter 21. John's taken to a high mountain to, to see it. Uh, it says he's carried, a, a, and he carried me away in the spirit, a phrase that's used 
uh, several times. So John not only is taken into the heavenlies, but into a future time where he's actually able to see uh, the new heaven, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, pre prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. That's the metaphor we saw last week. So the presentation, the next thing we see is the city is given a phenomenal description in verse 11 to 21. Having the glory of God, her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Again, the way uh, the tribes actually camped about the tabernacle uh, now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out like a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed. 12,000 furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured the wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its wall was of jasper. And the city was of pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius the seventh, crystallite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysoprasi, the eleventh, jacith, and the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. So here we get the, like the, some, the songs and even some of our jokes of Peter at the pearly gates or the streets of gold and uh, and so forth. But it's so what uh, David Hawking says in his book, Coming World Leader, about this. The city is a wonderful manifestation of the glory and the character of Almighty God. God prepared and designed a city that would truly reveal the wonder of his nature and would cause us all to worship him forever. I think that's what will happen. I mean, just the, uh, the character of the city, what it's made of, what it looks like, the symbolism that's there, what it all means, what it all represents. Do we really need a wall? Like there's some bad guys to keep out? No. Uh, but I, I begin and we'll see that wall, I think, talks about the, uh, the protection that God has given us through our, our whole lives. He's always been a wall around us. I think, again, everything about this city that we see as we go in, as we come out, will constantly remind you of what the Lord's done for us, his grace, his mercy, his love, his suffering, and will cause us to, uh, to worship him. And uh, it has already been noted, it's the, the glory of God that is the thing that really permeates this city. Uh, we talked about that last week, the fact that historically his glory was seen in the tabernacle and then in the temple when Solomon dedicates the temple. The glory of God appears there as the Shekinah glory uh, and uh, so heavy upon the people that the priests had to stop what they were doing. They couldn't continue the worship or the sacrifices and so forth. And certainly his glory dwells in believers and in the church in terms of the Holy Spirit. And in uh, one day it will be the light of this city. Uh, to Peter, Peter says this in terms of going up in the Mount of Transfiguration where they got to see time and eternity kind of peeled back for a moment, got to see Jesus in his glorified state. And of course, uh, they give a description of that in the Gospels. But later, Peter says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Uh, they got a little glimpse of, of God's glory. Again, you know, John can, can tell us what he saw. Uh, and, uh, and we can read the description and we can speculate to what it means, you know, and what it might mean to us then. But we really, we really, don't, we really don't know, you know. Uh, they got a little glimpse of God's glory. The city is going to, in a sense, emanate God's, God's glory. We'll talk about uh, what that might look like in a moment. But 
again, the, the psalmist tells us that the heavens declare God's glory. And, uh, and I think that uh, we may get little glimpses, you know, at a, a sunrise, a sunset, a, you know, a perfect time someplace, sometime where, you know, you're just kind of blown away by, uh, by, God's, uh, by God's creation, little incidents, things that, that happen that you just marvel at, uh, uh, at the Lord and, and, uh, and what you're seeing and so forth. I just... Uh, I uh, was uh, thinking about this. I actually went on a website and looked at some of the NASA photographs of uh, outer space and some of the star systems, and they're just incredibly, incredibly beautiful. And, uh, of course, we don't get a chance to see those except through a, a photograph. But uh, we're very fortunate to live in Hawaii and live in a place that's probably one of the most beautiful places on the face of the earth. And, uh, and in Hawaii, there's some very special places that uh, you can go and get away and just... Uh, in a sense, take in God's glory in terms of nature and creation. But however beautiful it is, it's all pale in reflection in terms of, of what uh, this city will be like. What will heaven be like? God's glory is there. Uh, the structure shows the phenomenal unity of Old and New Testament believers. Uh, the 12 gates of the 12 tribes of Israel and then the foundation stones. And, and uh, those will be... Spectacular. It shows us there still is a distinction on into eternity between Jews and Gentiles, although there's absolute equality, uh, even as there is uh, in the church today. But, uh, but again, it's, uh, I think every time we enter the city and we see those gates and we see those names and we see those stones, it'll tell us that heaven is for everybody. Uh, again, there's, in the Bible, there's only one race, the human race. There's only two ethnic groups, Jews and Gentiles, and everybody is there. And of course, we have the, during the tribulation period, an angel proclaiming the gospel in every, every tongue and tribe and nation, people group will be able to hear it. They're all going to be there in heaven uh, with us, uh, but it's for all of us. I thought of a verse in Ephesians uh, uh, 2.19 where uh, Paul says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. I wonder if every time we see those, those uh, foundation stones, if it'll remind us, you know, that, uh, wow, it's like uh, Paul's scripture. You know, it's like, uh, that's what our faith was built on, the teaching of the apostles of the New Testament, of the Old Testament. It was the word of God that was so important to us. And and brought such comfort and clarity to our lives. And, and here we are, a constant reminder every time we go in uh, and out of the city, a reminder of God's word. The city's measurements are phenomenal. Four square or equal on all sides uh, mean that uh, the new Jerusalem will either be a cube or, or a pyramid. Again, it's, if it's the same, same uh, measurement uh, this way, that way, and to the height, it's probably a cube. Some speculate a pyramid in shape, but either way, the measurements are, are, are amazing. Uh, the city wall there, if you haven't uh, know what a, a cubic is, it's 18 inches. So uh, the city wall, I think, is then 216 feet thick. It says it's a high wall. Uh, I mean, uh, if the city is 1,500 miles high, 200 feet is not a very high wall. So I think we're talking about the thickness uh, of, of the wall. Uh, and again, a furlong is 600 feet, so uh, the city is uh, 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles that way, 1,500 miles that way, and a wall around it that's very high proportionally uh, and is 200 feet uh, thick, uh, and that all leads to the beauty uh, of the city. We note that the beauty certainly would be seen in its foundation and again, the foundation speaks of permanence. Hebrews tells us that we are all pilgrims and strangers as we've lived on this land, this body at 10, all very temporary. And we're pilgrims always marching, making our way through, following the good shepherd, going from point A to point B, and one day we're going to arrive. And then there's the permanence uh, that the foundation will speak to us of how, how we can just be so blessed to be in this place and no longer on a journey uh, the colors uh, are a matter of a little bit of speculation, but uh, jasper is, uh, we've seen, as already described, as clear as crystal. So uh, some gemologists within would say that it would be much like a diamond. So there's a, a diamond 200 feet thick around the city that's very high. 
And then you have things, foundation stones in the city that are multicolored. Sapphire is a blue stone. Uh, Chalcedony is uh, greenish blue, emerald of green, we would assume. Sardonyx is like our onyx, a white stone streaked with brown, although some would say red uh, and white. Uh, sardius is a, a, a red stone. Crystallite, yellow quartz, like a modern topaz. Beryl is green, topaz, a yellow green. We're not sure about chrysoprasus, but uh, some say a, a golden tinted stone, others say apple green. And then uh, jacinth is blue, and amethyst is a, a rich purple or a blue red. So the foundation stones, 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles, and we don't know how thick they are, but all of these colors, 12 of them going up. Uh, and then we've got uh, the, uh, the walls of the city, uh, 216 feet thick uh, of, uh, of jasper. Again, verse 11, a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Uh, and then the gates themselves. In ancient time, a pearl was considered the royal gem, and that's what's going to make up uh, a single pearl of the gates. So, and I, I've said this before. I, you know, we all probably realize how a pearl is made. It's through irritation, in a sense, it's made through through suffering. And uh, and I think these these gates uh, of uh, of a single pearl, as we pass in and out of them, will remind us of the fact that we're able to do this because Christ suffered for us. And then there's an angel you know, on each one of the gates. I guess they'll be like the greeters at Walmart. Hey, have a good day. Hey, welcome to the city here. You know, it's like, what are the angels doing there? You know, somebody to shoot the breeze with. But uh, uh, there's, a, there's an angel. And again, it's not that we need protection from, from anyone or, or anything, but I think it will speak to us just the fact that what God has provided for us, what a blessing uh, it is. Uh, that we are able to dwell with him for all eternity. And then the beauty is seen in the streets of gold. Again, not 24 karat gold, but 100% gold, so pure uh, that it's transparent. And then the city, the city itself is, uh, is gold. So uh, quite a sight. John's doing the best he can to describe this, but uh, it gets better than this. In verse 22 to 27, because in the city is the presence of God. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, but there shall be by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So uh, God's presence is uh, in the city. There's no, there's no temple. Uh, there's no holy of holies. The whole thing is God's holy of holies. Again, in the uh, in the Old Testament, the, only the high priest and only once a year on Yom Kippur could he go into the Holy of Holies and into God's presence. Uh, and uh, in this whole city will have God's presence in it. So it's not like, well, I hope Jesus will come by and visit me in my mansion sometime. Uh, in your mansion, God's presence will, uh, will be there. Now, we still have a reference to, to going into his throne room and seeing his face and so forth which will be uh, an incredible experience. But uh, the idea is that the whole city is absolutely illuminated by God's presence. There's not a need for a sun, for a moon, or, uh, or a lamp. Now, in 1 John 5, 6, the same writer tells us, this is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And, uh, and that's what we're going to actually see in the New Jerusalem. Uh, John 8, 12, Jesus uh, spoke again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now there he's talking about light as in terms of walking out of the darkness, coming into a relationship with him and being forgiveness, uh, forgiven of our sins. And he's using a metaphor, but all these metaphors get realized uh, in, uh, in heaven in terms of everything that we use symbolic language for. Every metaphor that's described becomes a reality when we're 
uh, in heaven when we're in the presence of, uh, of God. It moves away from uh, the idea of simply symbolic language. And of course, we've said that uh, last week, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, is the city of no more. No more death, sorrow, crying or pain. No temple, no need of the sun or the moon, no night, no defilement, no more curse uh, upon the, the world at all, uh, an incredible place to, to live. And, and of course, it's, uh, if you kind of get the picture of these multicolors, this golden city with golden streets and the pearls, and then in the middle of it, God's light emanating from it, and then a diamond that's 200 feet thick wrapped around the whole time, I think it'll be very beautiful. What do you think? Don't you think that looks like a stained glass window? <laughs> I think it does. If we were to recreate it, I think it should be a stained glass window for some reason. I heard uh, one uh, gemologist uh, was basically presented uh, with this information and said, uh, what do you think it would look like? And he says, well, it would be uh, beautiful beyond compare. But uh, if God's light is what we think it is, and these stones are the size that we think they are, and the thickness of this wall is much like a diamond, it would be incredibly beautiful, except the human eye would never be able to look upon it. Uh, it would just be too, too much for it, in his professional opinion. And th that brought to mind 1 Corinthians 2.9. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. What will it be like? I don't think we can really know. <laughs> it will be so different from anything that we could uh, ever imagine. Uh, secondly, God's presence will light the city for nations and kings. And certainly uh, a practice we see in the Old Testament and uh, in historically as well, this idea of when you have a king and he's being honored, the other kings and so forth pay homage and bring gifts to him. And that's what we see here because that was God's original intention, that all peoples everywhere would know him, know his love, know his grace, be able to come and to worship him. And that's what's going to be taking place uh, in, in heaven. Isaiah speaks of this in Isaiah 60, 11. Therefore, your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night, that men may bring you the wealth of the nations or the Gentiles and their kings in procession. So that begs the question, who are the kings? And there's a, there's a couple of interesting speculative ideas about that. But the bottom line is that during the millennial kingdom, during the messianic kingdom, uh, God's people, you and I, based on our faithfulness in this life, will be given positions in that life where we will rule and reign with him. Uh, and for the most part, most commentators believe that that's what's being spoken of here, uh, that we will receive some kind of positions uh, and that there'll be opportunity for us to, in a sense, go in and, as we sang this morning, give gifts to the Lord to come before him and to uh, and to honor him. But it's kind of a sobering thought, isn't it? Again, we're trying to always uh, remind ourselves of these two things, that how we live our lives now for the Lord, eternal life is by God's grace alone. Uh, but at the same time, we'll stand before the Bema seat of Christ where rewards are handed out. And based on faithfulness, again, we want to hear God say to us one day, enter now my good and faithful servant. Good in character, faithful in servants. It's not who has the biggest and the best and the brightest and the mostest. It's whatever God's given us to do in this life. Are we faithful with it or not? Now, everybody in heaven is going to be totally blessed uh, being there. You know, I like uh, John Corson's comparison to his own kids, you know, growing up. And maybe you experienced this. I, I know we did. We, uh, when by the time they're two and three and crawling around, they, the, the best toys in the house or, or your Tupperware and your pots and pans for some reason. And we'd usually put the child locks on all the cabinets that we did not want them to get in, but left one they could get into where all the Tupperware was. And uh, 
<laughs> and uh, it would be uh, a regular occasion, you know, walking into the, uh, uh, the kitchen there and every piece of Tupperware is spread all over the kitchen floor and Melissa is going at it or whatever. And so I'd usually get down on the floor and play in the Tupperware with us. But, you know, I would get bored at that uh, at some point in time. Uh, obviously, you're going, good. And uh, that doesn't really, uh, you know, make your day to play with uh, Tupperware in the kitchen floor for the most part. But for a three-year-old, that's, that's great stuff. That's as good as it gets. You know, it's funny how they'll play longer with the cardboard box the gift came in rather than the gift itself because sometimes they just haven't reached the maturity level to realize the gift was the good thing, not, not the box. There are going to be people in heaven who have received God's grace and God's forgiveness, uh, and that's all. And they are going to be the pot bangers in heaven, and they're going to be having a great time. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, they're not going to be going, I wish I could be doing something else. They're just going to be having a great time. Uh, but at the same time, there's going to be other things to be done for the Lord in the Lord's service that will be going, giving to, based on our faithfulness to him now. So my exhortation is, don't settle for being a pot banger in heaven. <laughs> You'll be really happy at it, and we'll look at you and go, hey, God bless you. Have fun with that Tupperware today, you know. But see, there's going to be exploits and things to be done for the Lord in the Lord's service, uh, including, again, this phrase that we see over and over in the scriptures, the ruling and the reigning with the Lord. So the city is, is presented by a mighty angel, phenomenal description. The best part is God's presence. Uh, in chapter 22, verse 1 to 5, is a picture of eternal life based on some of the other things in the city. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So several interesting things here, but... The picture includes the, the river that's from God's, God's throne. And we think of before the fall here on earth when things were perfect. There was the four rivers that are mentioned in the Garden of Eden. You've got Ezekiel and his picture of the millennial temple, uh, the messianic temple that will be there. And there's a, a river that flows out of the temple itself. Uh, but this is different because the river flows right from the throne of God, which certainly speaks uh, in a picture of eternal life. Jesus used those kinds of words of, uh, of a well that would spring up in us to overflowing to describe eternal life that we can have in him. Uh, we've got a river of life now coming from the very throne of God, which speaks of its purity as well. Uh, and then later in this chapter, verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who uh, hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So it's, uh, again, a picture of eternal life that the Lord's given us. And every time we're in the city and every time we walk by, maybe we'll start singing that song, I Got a River of Life. Maybe not. Maybe we'll have different songs then, but uh, it will remind us of the eternal life that God has given us. But I think it'll remind us of the, the blessings as well because it's coming right from the throne of God. Now, Psalm 46, verse 4 kind of hints at this. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. So there's something about this river, according to the psalmist, that will make us glad as well. Uh, as I think we come to understand in a better way God's love for us. The picture includes the tree of life. Remember, it was uh, first seen in Genesis 2, uh, where it was there in the prohibition against eating from the tree of life. And then we have the fall of man in chapter 3, verse 22 to 24, when uh, Adam and Eve, the first man and woman in their perfection and in a wonderful relationship with God, chose to rebel against that uh, and against him, uh, taking and eating that fruit. Now it's in heaven 
uh, and were able to eat from it. Uh, and you probably saw that verse about the mangoes that would be growing. Is that in there? I'm not sure. I think it's mangoes. It's, it just says fruit. I just assumed it was a mango that was growing on it. There's, what are the other 11, if that's one? I'll let you figure that out. But one of them's got to be a mango, right? Or something better than uh, the fruit that, uh, that is there that we are able to, uh, to eat from. The curse has been removed, and that's a, a testimony uh, to us of, uh, of that fact. So again, eating and drinking, common symbols that uh, tell us that we will have a, a deep communion and a relationship with God in this beautiful city. The, the leaves that are, um, again, speak of, of uh, eternal life that are for the healing of the nations. Nobody's sick, uh, so that's not what it's a reference to. It's just talking about the health and vitality that God gives us uh, in this place. Um, and uh, I don't know if we could liken it to maybe things that we take to stay healthy as opposed to things that we take to help us get well. It's, uh, it's not for that kind of uh, healing. Uh, the picture includes those who serve the Lord. The throne of God's there. The Lamb is there. Uh, and His servants will serve Him. And, uh, and the glorious thing about that is that sir, we try to serve the Lord now in a lot of things that we do. And, and of course, uh, the verse very often comes to mind when we want to serve the Lord. The, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak <laughs> in terms of uh, uh, getting to some place where we can do and so forth to serve the Lord in whatever capacity it might be. Uh, there's always the issue of, uh, uh, you know, the, the mixed motive, you know, I, yeah, I'm serving the Lord, but uh, boy, you know, I don't know if I'm doing this for selfish reasons or what, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, I, I would just encourage you uh, to not worry about that, just do it. Uh, is the main thing. But when we serve the Lord there, it won't be any of that. There won't be any of that. I mean, the curse is removed. There's no sin nature. It'll just be a, a joy uh, to, uh, to serve the Lord. You probably experience that some, sometimes now. You get little glimpses of, you know, you just do something and you know it was the Spirit of God, you know, kind of prodding you and then you were obedient to it and you do it and then you see God work and you go... Yeah, why don't I do that more often? And that's our whole life uh, in heaven. It's just going to be a, 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 glorious, a glorious time. I, uh, I just remember that one of the first times that I, that I taught a Bible study, which was, was absolutely uh, very, very frightening, very, very scary. And, uh, and uh, I took this Bible study over. I should put this in context with Danny Lehman. There was probably about 20 people. And by the time I taught it for six weeks, there was like eight people left, you know, and uh, two of them were related to me. But, uh, you know, so it was kind of tough going. But uh, at the same time, when you share your testimony or you do something where you step out in faith, it, it's, it is an awesome thing to realize that God's spirit just worked through me. And uh, I, I distinctly remember the thought that that was better than surfing, which was like at, at my uh, brain at that time was kind of the ultimate thing. And uh, and uh, continue to uh, feel that way today. One writer said it will be perfect service in a perfect environment. We don't know all of the, the details of, of what we'll be doing, what it will be, but uh, it'll be It'll be great, and we shall reign with him, it says, forever and ever. And, and of course, the wonderful line about, uh, about seeing his face. And uh, I just think that uh, that will mean, that, you know, there's some songs that we sing that talk about, and then we'll see his face, see the face of, uh, of Jesus, and what, uh, what an incredible thing that will, uh, that will be. I wanted to uh, kind of close with a couple of things. I've got a quote uh, from Anne Graham Lotz, uh, her book, Visions of His Glory, which is a great study on the, uh, at least portions of the book uh, of Revelation. Uh, and she kind of uh, turns the corner, which I think is a good one to do, the idea that, uh, uh, that God's presence will be there. It'll be an incredibly beautiful city. Uh, and these things will speak to us, I think, in a way that draws us more and more uh, in love with the Lord and, and uh, to worship Him and to give Him praise. Uh, it'll be just a glorious thing. But uh, you've got the angels there and so forth, but you've got people there as well. You've got all the Old Testament saints that are there and uh, people that uh, we've maybe always wanted to know historically and, and talk with them and as well as family members and loved ones. And this is what she's making reference to. 
She says, surely our joy will permeate heaven and our words of praise uh, as we tell others what our great God has done for us. I do hope we will see a video of Genesis 1. I can already guarantee you it won't start with a big bang. <laughs> and, and what will it be like to hear Mrs. Noah's testimony, to pray with Daniel, to see Enoch walk, to hear David sing, to watch Elijah call in the name of the Lord, to listen to Peter preach and Peter say anything he feels like saying. I would like to hear the testimony of missionaries seeking to spread the gospels in the jungles of South America whose lives were threatened, even taken by drug lords. I would like to hear the testimony of pastors in Africa encouraging their starving congregations and the testimonies of Christians in Eastern Europe who chose to love their neighbors as themselves and the testimonies of those living under atheistic regimes who chose to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength regardless of the earthly consequences. And I'd like to hear the testimony of ordinary believers. I would like to hear your testimony. I would want to hear the testimonies of businessmen and women who maintain integrity when confronted with greed, and of young people who maintain their purity when confronted with immorality, and of marriage partners who maintain their unity when confronted with divorce, and of housewives who maintain their families when confronted with careers, and of single parents who produce godly children while out of necessity maintaining jobs and homes. I want to hear the testimony of the sufficiency of God's grace. I want to hear the thrilling stories of how his strength was made perfect in weakness when a spouse suddenly walked out, when a child was killed, when a parent died, when a business was lost, when tragedy struck. It will take an eternity for us to hear all the testimonies we want to hear, and every single testimony will be a story of God's mercy and great faithfulness that are new every morning and fresh every evening, the entire universe will resound with our praise to his glory. Now, I don't know what else we'll be doing in heaven, but I think we'll be doing a, a, little, a little bit of that. I just want to leave you this, this one other idea. I went down and did the devotion for the start of the, the Jesus Loves You Walk in Waimanalo and shared a passage out of uh, yesterday morning. I shared a passage out of um, uh, Philippians uh, I think it's about 119 or 120 where, again, Paul's in a Roman prison. He's not in the Mambertine prison in the dungeon yet. He's, uh, it's his first imprisonment. He's in a prison in Rome, basically being kind of kept in almost like an apartment like. He's chained to the Roman guards, but he's waiting a sentence of death. Uh, and in that, he writes a letter back to the church at Philippi, or Philippi and he, he's explained to them how they can have joy no matter what the circumstances are in their lives. Uh, which, which in context makes it uh, worth, worth reading. Uh, and there's a part of that where he talks about there should be a healthy tension uh, in our lives. And uh, all of us probably go, no, that's one thing I don't need, tension. But there's actually a healthy tension uh, that we should have in our lives because he says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But I will remain that it may be fruitful labor for you. So somehow he knows from the Lord that he's going to get released. He says, I would rather depart and be with the Lord in heaven, but I know that I'm going to stay and, and that it'll be fruitful in terms of my coming to you. He says, I'm torn between these two things, these two desires. And I think that's a healthy tension. That's where we should be. Uh, it's been said that uh, if you're too heavenly minded, you'll be no earthly good. That's not in the Bible. I'm going to say the opposite is true. Unless we're heavenly minded, we won't be any earthly good. So as we study about heaven, we think about heaven, what it will be like for all eternity, that's, and realize that to depart it'd be, uh, is uh, better by far, Paul says. How many of you want to go to heaven this afternoon? We've got a bus waiting right outside here. You know. It's like we try real hard to stay out of that place that we kind of were trying to get to. Uh, uh, but again, that's where our eternal perspective should be. Stretched with that, the idea that, but there's, it's a limited time offer in terms of what we can do for the Lord while, while we're here. One of the new books I uh, just picked up, the title of it 
is uh, what you can't do in heaven. <laughs> and what you can't do in heaven is lead somebody to the Lord. <laughs> so you got to do that now. And it's a book about personal evangelism. Uh, but there's a lot of things we can do to serve the Lord, but it's a limited time offer. Uh, and God has... We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And so we just figure out what those are and walk in them uh, and enjoy the pleasure of uh, being able to serve the Lord now. And that it will be fruitful, not only for others that we're coming in contact with, but fruitful for ourselves as well. So that's, that's the tension that we should live under as believers yeah, we're going to be with the Lord. It's going to be glorious, and I'm ready. <laughs> I desire to part and be with Christ. Uh, but at the same time, I want to be stretched with this idea that I have a, a limited time, what I can do for the Lord. That's the eternal perspective. That's the healthy tension that Paul lived under. I think part of the reasons he could have joy locked up in a Roman prison, not knowing whether he'd be released or not. If we have that in mind, I think it can make a great difference and as we envision the city, the new Jerusalem, uh, I think it's for the reason to make us long to be there, but at the same time realize that that's for all eternity. And right now we've got a short opportunity to serve the Lord. Heart. I cried to the Lord and he lifted me up. He feeds my hunger. He fills my cup. Uphold me, my God is my rock. God is my rock, His love is strong. He heals my wounds with the strength of His song. He quiets my trembling, He leads me on. His arm will defend me, my God is my rock. My rock, my rock, though my defenses fall apart. My rock, my rock, the mountains fall, my God. He is my rock, my rock, the fears tear me apart. My He heals my wounds with the strength of his song. He quiets my trembling. He leads me on. The song will defend me. My God is my rock. My rock, my rock. Will my defenses fall apart? the Lord.
be moved. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. I have set the Lord before me. He's at my right hand. I will bless the Lord so holy. He is my inheritance. As for my God, He will preserve me. As for my God, He makes me strong. As for my I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. I will love you, Lord, my deliverer. I will love you, Lord. Your Yes, sir. 
sovereign hand before I fall again. Stronger than the might of man, deeper than the depths of sin. Grace comes again and again with love that will not end. With my eyes cast down and my life in my hands, I offer up to you, my God. I give you all that I am, and you I'll be what I Eternal in me. Eternal in me. Eternal in me. 